first of all, I'd really like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak, and I'd also really like to thank uh, specifically Hossein and, and also John for hosting us last night at the dinner. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, my name is Shimon Kolkwitz. I'm a postdoc in Junis Group at Jilla, um, and I guess it looks like my references and things might be cut off, so if you want to know what any of the citations are and things and you can't read them, then please come, come ask me after. That's not intentional. <laughs> So, um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit today about um, some recent progress that we've made uh, on optical lattice clocks in the lab, but I'm going to motivate it from the perspective of sort of uh, applications to cosmology, where I use the term cosmology in a very loose and broad, broad sense to mean kind of fundamental physics in general and the study of the cosmos. So, um, so here's an outline of my talk. I'll start with some uh, applications of optical lattice clocks uh, to cosmology. I'll talk specifically about one proposal we have for potentially doing uh, gravitational wave detection with optical lattice clocks in space. That's very related to what Mark was telling you about earlier this morning. Um, and uh, I hope that those two things will kind of nicely lead into um, then a brief overview of kind of what we've done so far with optical lattice clocks and what the state of the art is and what some of the limitations are. Um, and then I'll tell you about, I think, some very exciting new results on, on sort of what, what we think is the next generation of optical lattice clocks that will help sort of tackle some of those limitations and hopefully I'll convince you will eventually help with some of these sort of cosmological applications, and then I'll conclude. So um, let's just start with sort of uh, some applications of, cosmo uh, of optical lattice clocks to cosmology. Um, and this is kind of a, a boring point, but I think it, it can't be made enough, which is that um, if you look at the way now the units are being redefined in the new system that's being adopted by both NIST and the International Bureau of Weights and Measures, um, the second is really the only unit that we sort of measure and everything else is defined using constants that we're familiar with that are just defined, um, and, and then by measuring sort of this hyperfine transition in cesium. And so what that means really is that the extent to which you can measure time using clocks determines the uh, precision with which you can measure essentially any other unit. And so um, what we hope to do at some point in the future is replace that uh, radio frequency hyperfine transition in cesium with potentially an optical transition, for example, in strontium-87, which is the atom that we use in our optical lattice clocks. Um, beyond that, there's a number of other ways that I think clocks can uh, contribute to cosmology. And, and here, there's some examples of, of tests of both special and general relativity. So in particular, in, in 1972, Hafley and Keating did this uh, really nice, uh, very cute experiment where they took commercially available Hewlett-Packard uh, atomic clocks on an airplane, they uh, bought two seats for the clock and two first class tickets for themselves. And they flew around the world first in one direction and then in the other direction. And they compared each time uh, the clock that flew with a clock that they left back in the lab. And um, so they were both able to see the special relativistic effects of flying either with the rotation of the Earth or against the rotation of the Earth and the general relativistic effects of actually being uh, at a high altitude in the airplane. Um, and that was really kind of nice, cute, and uh, relatively cheap, although uh, I looked, so, so they spent $8,000 on this experiment, 7,600 of which were on the first class tickets for them and the clock. And in inflation adjusted numbers, that's actually about $50,000. So not, not that cheap, but still pretty cheap relative to most laboratory scale experiments. Um, so now, uh, sorry, I'm sorry for the sort of uh, bad quality of this, but uh, at NIST using uh, a single, uh, single trapped ion clock, an optical ion clock, they were able to do the same kind of experiments and see the special relativistic shifts of the atom uh, of the ion moving in their uh, their trap here at speeds of sort of tens or even few meters per second. So that's really kind of the speed of someone biking or jogging, something like that. And they can see the special relativistic uh, time dilation, and they can also see the general relativistic effects of just lifting, literally by jacking up their uh, optical table by only 30 centimeters, uh, so about a, about a foot they were able to see the general relativistic shift that you get from that with their clocks. So you're talking about going from, uh, in the 70s, measuring these effects at sort of airplane speeds and airplane heights to sort of laboratory scales. Um, and, and I think that's really showed, shows the power of making better clocks. Um, in addition, uh, there's also been a number of experiments looking at the variation of fundamental constants with time. So I guess there were some astrophysical observations that indicated that it's possible that uh, the fine structure constant may be changing with time. Um, and you can put limits on that by comparing the transitions of different um, optical clocks. Uh, and here, I would say that one, one important point to make is that these measurements were partially limited by the accuracy of the world clock. So if you had a better world clock to compare all of these different optical transitions to, um, you'd actually be able to put even stricter limits on variations of both the proton uh, to electron mass ratio and uh, variations of um, 
the fine structure constant in time. Um, related to that, there have been recent proposals from some people uh, at this conference, and I'm really looking forward to the talks about this, um, on potentially searching for certain candidates for dark, of dark matter using kind of similar type of experiments. So here, this is a proposal from Professor Derevyanko, um, looking at sort of a specific candidate of dark matter and causing uh, networks of clocks to start to tick out of sync with each other. So as, we, as these sort of dark matter um, clumps or waves pass through the network, these clocks will start to become out of phase with each other. And here you can actually use um, the same network of clocks that are all the same atom. There are also proposals for different candidates of dark matter where uh, you might sort of see similar things to what people were looking for with a fine structure variation where you look at different atomic uh, species and isotopes in order to see sort of different, uh, different transitions changing differently, which kind of looks like a fine structure constant changing, but it would be at, you know, in time transients due to this ultralight dark matter. Um, so those are, I, I hope, uh, kind of convince you that there's some applications, direct applications of clocks to cosmology. And I'll tell you a little bit about some proposals we have, and this is in collaboration with Misha, who's here in the audience, uh, Ron Walsworth, who will also talk a little bit about this this afternoon, uh, Igor Pakovsky, who's at ITAMP, and also Nick Langelier, one of uh, Ron's grad students, and my advisor, June, on doing gravitational wave detection with uh, optical lattice clocks in space. Um, and of course, you can't really talk about gravitational waves now without first mentioning LIGO. I think, I mean, um, um, I mean just amazing and tremendous results and a real triumph uh, uh, for physics. Um, and uh, here they're using, you know, a large scale uh, Michelson interferometer, essentially with four kilometer long uh, arms, and, uh, but then with a circulating cavity, so they end up having a finesse of about 200, so something like a um, 1,000 kilometers of total uh, sort of arm length in both arms, and they make differential length change measurements on the order of 1,000th of a proton they're sensitive to in the, in the, in the region where they're optimally sensitive. And doing that, they were able to see two gravitational waves with a, you know, a high enough degree of certainty to really classify them as gravitational wave events of black hole mergers, two different binary black hole mergers, and one that was most likely an event, but they didn't have the statistical confidence to say for sure that it was. And looking at this plot, um, this is kind of related to the point that Mark was making earlier, you can see that actually all of these events came in from free lower frequency range that's outside of the range of frequencies that LIGO can see, and the reason for that is because they're just limited by seismic noise on Earth. So they really can't see anything below about 10 hertz uh, in the sort of range of sensitivity that you need to see these gravitational wave events. And also I'd point out that they really only saw these gravitational wave events for on the order of a second time scale, and unfortunately that's not fast enough for us to point any of our other telescopes or anything at the region of sky where we think this might be happening. And so if you want to know if there's ga associated gamma ray bursts or anything like that, this just isn't enough time, enough warning. Um, and so for that reason, people have, uh, and for other reasons, which is that there are other sources that LIGO, unfortunately, uh, can't really hope to see, more massive binaries and things like that, people have proposed space-based detectors like uh, LISA and ELISA um, uh, in order to look in this lower frequency range and to hopefully also give some forewarning about the events like this gravitational wave that they saw um, so that they can point telescopes at it. And uh, one, one point that I'd like to make, and I think Mark already eloquently made this point, is that there's kind of a gap here between what, um, uh, you know, what LISA hopes to be sensitive to and, and will, will be sensitive to once it launches and where LIGO is right now. And of course, A, the gravitational waves like the one that they saw will pass through that um, that window and will be there for weeks or months. Um, and if you hope to watch them during that period, you'd like to have a detector that can do that. Um, but in addition, there's also kind of a gap in the sort of predicted different kinds of astrophysical phenomena that could give it. And my, my feeling is that that's partially because uh, people are doing estimates for where the detectors are expected to be. So there should also be kind of interesting astrophysical sources in this region here that we'd maybe like to look at. Um, and it turns out that if you look at the current limits on what, uh, what, what sets the, the current limits for the, uh, the strength of gravitational waves in that frequency range, in the millihertz uh, and microhertz frequency range kind of in here, you see that it's actually these Doppler tracking measurements using spacecrafts. And so what this really consists of is just spacecrafts that were intended for other purposes, like Cassini that went to Saturn and took lots of really beautiful pictures. And they um, send radio frequency signals back and forth between Cassini and if you, if you track the, the, the frequency of those uh, radio waves, you can tell the relative velocity of the spacecraft with respect to Earth. And if a gravitational wave passes between you and that um, spacecraft, you'll get a Doppler shift due to the sort of space-time stretching from the gravitational wave. 
And um, you can use that to put limits, at least, on the strength of gravitational waves in this frequency range. And I, the point I'd like to make is that this kind of detector is a little bit different than the uh, optical interferometer detectors in that um, you're actually making a slightly different measurement. You're, you're, you're measuring the frequency as opposed to the phase of the optical light. And so you're kind of sensing relative velocities of the two things as opposed to differential length changes, the way that uh, LIGO and LISA are intended to operate. And as a result, you, you end up with a kind of different sensitivity function. There's this thing called the detector transfer function, which characterizes um, the response of your detector to a specific frequency of gravitational wave. This is independent of the measurement you actually make or anything. And, it's, and phase and frequency are just sort of associated with each other by a, a derivative in time. And so that gives you this extra factor of f, actually. And what that means is that for the same length detector, um, a phase detector, like an interferometer, is better off if the wavelength of the gravitational wave is longer than the arm length, which is the re regime that Lisa op LIGO operates in and Lisa is intended to operate in. But a frequency detector or a Doppler tracking measurement like this is actually better off with a shorter wavelength um, than the arm length. And you can understand that just by thinking about what, what you're measuring, which is that in the case of the optical interferometer, the photon is traveling and you're kind of measuring the travel time, transit time, that gives rise to this phase. And so if the wave gravitational wave passes faster than the overall transit time, it'll start to average out. It'll start to wash out. But for the Doppler tracking, I really only care about the velocity when it leaves my one part of my detector and the velocity when it arrives at the other part. And so if that's too fast, if, that's, if it leaves and arrives too quickly relative to the wavelength, I won't see anything. But as long as it's longer than this overall wave uh, period, I'm fine. And so uh, with that as a motivation, yeah. Yeah. So does it enter this? Or? No, not yet. Uh, certainly it will, and I'll, I'll definitely discuss that. But this is completely sort of independent of that. So this is just saying I have some, some way of measuring optical frequency. Um, and of course, you're right. There will be an additional transfer function that comes from the way that I measure optical frequency. And I, I, w I will talk about that, um, because that, that enters directly into our proposal. But this is, an, is sort of independent. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a purely mathematical statement. Um, OK, so, uh, so with, with that in mind and, and inspired by both proposals from, uh, from Mark uh, and, and his group at Stanford and also a proposal here from Avi Loeb and Dan Moaz uh, uh, proposing using atomic clocks to detect gravitational waves, we started thinking about is there a good way that you might be able to do this in space. Um, and so uh, because of the arguments I just gave, the, the, the regime that we're considering is a really long arm length. So we want to be longer than the wavelength of the gravitational wave which is a bit different than what Lisa and, and, and what Mark in general are proposing. And we propose putting two satellites in orbit around the sun. Um, e and each one has its uh, astronium optical lattice clock or an optical lattice clock in it. And we, um, because we need to confine our atoms uh, in order to make a sensitive clock, uh, you know, a very precise clock, we actually still adopt this uh, free mass or reference mass that's used by LISA and that's been tested and demonstrated by LISA Pathfinder. And what we propose to do is to really trap our atoms in the optical lattice against the clock. So to, to sort of have the atoms trapped in the same reference frame as these really nice uh, reference masses that are being developed for use by LISA. Um, and we also need an, uh, an ultra-stable optical laser in each satellite. And the idea is to lock the laser in satellite B to satellite A and then to perform uh, synchronized measurements between the two clocks to cancel out laser frequency noise, as Mark kind of already discussed, um, in kind of the same uh, spirit as the way LISA cancels out laser frequency noise by having two arms. So by actually probing at exactly the same time and then just doing a differential measurement between the atoms in A and B, you can really get, we hope and believe, down to being limited not by the laser line width, but by the atom line width itself. Um, and just to kind of show you that that's not pure fantasy, here is a really nice paper that just came out of uh, the Katori group in Japan um, just a few weeks ago where they're doing uh, geopotential measurements. So this is the same kind of measurement I showed you before where you're seeing a general relativistic shift of, uh, the clock, of, of a clock frequency due to the gravity that it, local gravity that it's experiencing. And what they did is they had one clock at Riken and one clock at University of Tokyo, which are separated by um, about 30 kilometers or so. And um, uh, they connected them by an optical fiber, and, um, and then they locked the laser at, I believe, University of Tokyo to the laser at Riken, and they either performed clock comparisons over this optical fiber, either without locking the two lasers together 
with the two lasers locking together but not synchronizing the two measurements or actually synchronizing the two measurements. And what they found was that they could suppress the laser noise first by using the same effective laser to probe both clocks and then again even more by actually probing them in a synchronized fashion so that the laser noise really kind of drops out of the measurement. And here they were mostly dominated in the end by fiber phase no residual fiber phase noise on the optical link. And doing this, they were able to measure a height difference of about five centimeters uh, for an, a an, an absolute difference of 15 meters with a precision of about five centimeters or so. Um, so this is really kind of the same sort of thing that we're proposing doing in space for our gravitational wave detector, but over much longer length scales. And so now um, plugging in some numbers, we're proposing an incredibly long arm length. So uh, five times 10 to the 10 or 50 million kilometers um, arm length. So you really need to be in orbit around the sun. You can't be in orbit around the Earth. Um, and uh, an atom number of about, about 10 million or, or, or 7 million or so strontium atoms in the clock. And we're plugging in this 160 second coherence time. So we're really assuming that we can get rid of laser noise, not worry about our local oscillator anymore, and really be limited by the strontium radiative line width. And then you see, now getting to Andre's question, you see that if we do uh, a Ramsey type measurement where we take full advantage of this 160, microsecond, uh, 160 second coherence time, we can really be maximally sensitive right at three millihertz uh, to a gravitational wave with a, with, a, with a period of three millihertz or half a period of three millihertz. Um, and there you can see, okay, we're, we're, for the numbers that we plugged in, we're competitive with LISA, but we're not even really beating LISA. And if you look at the scaling, it actually looks pretty similar to the scaling with LISA because for the same reason I gave earlier, which is that um, you know, in time, uh, in space, LISA has this problem where a photon for a higher frequency wave will average out as, it, as the gravitational wave os oscillates faster than the um, travel time. Here, the gravitational wave is oscillating faster than our measurement time, and so it will again just average out the signal at higher frequencies, and you get this 1 over f scaling that looks pretty bad. But of course, we know how to fix that. We can just do a faster Ramsey measurement, and then we get this uh, 1 over square root of f scaling um, that's a result of, or sorry, square root of f scaling, which is a result of the increased projection noise, because now we've performed a bunch of Ramsey measurements instead of one, so you get this increase in atom projection noise, and now we're unfortunately not taking full advantage of the coherence time of our strontium transition again, because we have to make each measurement the length of the half period of the wave. And so for that, there are these nice, what we call dynamical decoupling, and <laughs> what you call sort of resonant pulse sequences. Um, and uh, we use these, uh, for example, CPMG or XY sequences, where you apply a pi pulse in sync with the gravitational wave in order to kind of match the phase uh, accumulation of your atoms to this oscillating AC signal. And when you do that, now you find you can actually push uh, your sensitivity to be flat at higher frequencies for this particular detector. But you've, uh, in the process, made your detector incredibly narrow band because you're really performing a kind of lock-in measurement and you're only sensitive to one particular frequency. And so while um, you know, we think this is a, sort of a quite nice um, sort of approach, there's a lot of improvement still to be made. So if you look at uh, optical lattice clocks right now that we have in the lab, they're sitting up around here if you tried to make one of these detectors based on that. And we need about three orders of magnitude or a little bit better improvement. Um, and what I hope to convince you of is that uh, at least one order of magnitude can really come um, from some of the improvements that we've already made by moving from a 1D optical lattice clock to a 3D optical lattice clock, as I'll describe. Um, and the other two orders of magnitude can really mostly come just from increasing the atom number. So uh, up here, we've plugged in 7 times 10 to the 6. And normally, we're operating with about 10 to the 3 strontium atoms. And so because of square root of n, you get this extra two orders of magnitude. And I think that um, once there's a reason for that, which is related to the, to, to, to the reason that we can't actually probe for 160 seconds, as I'll tell you. And now that we've kind of gotten past that, I think it's more of just a technical challenge to actually increase the atom number to the amount that's really required. So I don't think this is as ambitious as it sort of looks. Um, and so just to put now that sensitivity in context compared to Lisa and Ely, so you can see that this flat uh, part of our, our sensitivity is really um, you know, bridging the gap to some extent between uh, LISA and LIGO, and in this region, which might be uh, interesting to both track events as they leave the LISA band or maybe never entered the LISA band and enter the LIGO band so that you can point telescopes at it and follow them during their evolution and also to maybe look for other interesting astrophysical sources. And as a reminder, our sensitivity here is really a narrow band detector that we're tuning around. And so it's not the same as these broadband detectors like LISA and LIGO, and I do want to emphasize that, but I think there's room, just like there is in traditional astronomy, for both sort of wide field and narrow field uh, telescopes to do kind of 
wide band and narrow band detection and tunable narrow band detection, kind of like what Keith Schwab was describing with his detector as well. Um, okay, so now uh, hopefully I've convinced you that, that this is worth potentially pursuing, but how do we really get here? Uh, so what are the current limits on optical lattice clocks and how can we push that to where we need it to be? Um, so first of all, why optical as opposed to microwave? Um, you can see that just by looking at the expression for the fractional frequency stability for an atomic clock, and you see that there's this Q factor, the, the line width of the, of the frequency relative to the transition, uh, the frequency of the transition itself. Um, and so that immediately motivates you to go from the microwave uh, 10 to the 10 hertz or so up to the terahertz optical regime uh, if you can find the same line width transitions. And it turns out you can. So for example, we use strontium 87, and there is this very nice uh, 1 millihertz line width transition. So that corresponds to a Q of 10 to the 18 relative to its frequency. Um, but in order to actually take advantage of this, we have to do a lot of work. So first of all, um, there's these other nice uh, cycling transitions. First, there's an allowed transition here, the 1s0 to 1p1, that we use for a first stage of cooling to get our atoms down to uh, 1 millikelvin or so. Um, then uh, there's a second singly forbidden transition that we use uh, in order to do a further stage of cooling down to about 1 microkelvin. And then you might say, OK, now hopefully we can probe this doubly forbidden transition here. But it turns out that even at 1 microkelvin, our Doppler broadened line width would be about 40 kilohertz, so quite a bit more than this 1 millihertz. So you need to do something else. And the trick that we use is to put it in an optical lattice. And so the idea is to form a standing wave of light, and we use this magic wavelength for the clock transition so that that light, at least ideally, doesn't shift your optical frequency at all and doesn't affect your clock transition. And then if you strongly confine your atoms uh, enough along the axis that you're uh, interrogating them on, you get this nice effect where you're in the Lambdicky and sideband resolved regimes, so you push the motional sidebands out away from the carrier and you're no longer sensitive to them. And so now you really can hopefully probe this carrier transition, which really corresponds to not changing emotional quanta along the axis of confinement, so that you can hopefully really take full advantage of the narrow line width. But in order to take advantage of the narrow line width, you also need a nice laser. And so we have these beautiful uh, cavities that have been, uh, a lot of work's been done to engineer them. This is our 40 centimeter uh, ultra-stable ULE cavity, which is right now the workhorse in our lab uh, for both of our strontium optical lattice clocks. It has a line width of 26 millihertz, and it, that corresponds to a quality factor of 2 times 10 to 16. And so that really corresponds to this overall length change for four, a 40 centimeter length changing by less than one tenth of the radius of a proton. And that maybe doesn't sound so impressive compared to LIGO with their one one thousandth of a radius of a proton, but they only achieve that uh, up at hundreds of hertz. And we really are sensitive closer to DC. So we're talking about really low frequencies. You can actually see that the stability of this fractional instability of this cavity stays at a 10 to the minus 16 level out to about 100 or 1,000 seconds. So this is a really well engineered and impressive uh, laser cavity. And to give you another uh, you know, sort of figure of merit, the light that, that we lock to this cavity is coherent for enough for about 10 round trips to the moon and back. So in principle, you could build an interferometer where you send the light back and forth to the moon 10 times and then interfere it with the light coming straight out of the cavity, and it would still give you fringes, um, which I think is, is, is really quite astounding. And so using these ultra-stable cavities combined with our optical lattice clocks, uh, we have two of them, and we were able to do a two-clock comparison to really demonstrate um, at an averaging time of about 10 to the 4 a uh, statistical uh, stability or uh, you know, fractional frequency uh, stability of about 2 times 10 to the 8. 10, 2 times 10 to the minus 18, um, and also a systematic uncertainty of about 2 times 10 to the minus 18. And so looking at sort of clock performance, that puts us right down here for this clock comparison. Um, so if you look at, at, at the systematics, you can see here, you know, it's limited by a number of things, including um, this lattice, uh, the, the temperature is, a, is actually, the black body shifts are a, a major systematic, and also the lattice start shift. Um, but actually, what I, one point I'd like to make is that for some of the things we're proposing, like these gravitational waves, we don't necessarily care about systematic uncertainty as much as making differential measurements between two clocks and just looking at the statistical uncertainty. So we don't care about absolute frequency. We just like to look at this differential measurement. And for that, we're really dominated or limited by something else. And that's this density shift and density broadening effect that we have in our clock. So if you try to uh, probe this one millihertz line width transition with this 26 millihertz line width laser, what you find is that if you do a one second Ravi pulse, you're more or less still Fourier limited. But if you try to do um, a four second pulse, you're no longer Fourier limited. And it turns out that this sort of 500 millihertz line width, which is about the best that we've seen in our, in our clock, you also notice the excitation fraction 
or the number of atoms that actually get excited is significantly reduced. Um, that's actually limited by density effects in our 1D lattice. So in particular, if you crank the density up so that you have many atoms per pancake here in this 1D lattice, what you find is that the line width broadens out considerably. Here you can see it's broadening out to about 5 hertz or so um, and the, um, for a one-second clock pulse. And that's actually due to atom, atom collisions inside of our 1D lattice. So even though we have spin-polarized fermions, um, they can still have P-wave collisions. And so if you look at this line shape, you can actually kind of see that there's sort of two different uh, transitions here that correspond to sort of the, the Bayer carrier transition that's broadened and then also this sort of interaction peak that's also there and also relatively broad. And so this is the problem that we really have to solve. Up until now, the approach has really been to just reduce the density to get rid of this broadening. But now you're, you're hurting your signal to noise. You can see that here that you can increase your excitation fraction and narrow your line, but all of a sudden the error bars on each of these points gets much bigger. And so that's really why these optical clocks have stuck with uh, atom numbers on the order of 10 to the 3 or so is because there's no real advantage to increasing that atom number. It actually just broadens your line. Um, and so what I hope to convince you is that the next generation clock that we've now built helps um, bypass that in the whole problem. So in particular, this next generation 3D optical lattice clock, um, which we load from a Fermi degenerate gas in order to get close to near unit uh, filling fraction and roughly speaking about one atom per lattice site. Um, uh, well, same, same statement. But, um, anyway, and uh, also, you know, just to really maximize the number of atoms that we can load into this uh, 3D lattice trap uh, allows us to also have, on the sites where we have more than one atom per site, spectrally resolved interactions. And so to actually use the same kind of trick that we use for the motional sidebands to get rid of this as a problem. So as, as Mark said, everything looks better in SOLIDWORKS. So um, here is what the new experiment looks like in CAD. And um, it's, the vacuum is quite good in the system, so we've improved the vacuum lifetime to better than one minute. Uh, for the atoms that we have in our uh, experiment. And we also have improved optical access in order to build this 3D optical lattice as opposed to 1D. And here uh, was the sort of a picture taken when, they, uh, when we first got a, a blue MOT in our new uh, apparatus. Um, and now we load from the red MOT, which is that second stage of cooling, we do an additional stage of cooling in a crossed op optical dipole trap and do evaporative cooling down to about 50 nanokelvin and a uh, close to the to Fermi degeneracy, so we have a T over TF of about 0.19 or so. Um, and so what that uh, then means is that when we actually load into this 3D lattice, we find that we're really loading entirely into the ground band of the lattice. So for those of you who are used to looking at kind of time of flight imagery, you can see this nice square shaped pattern that really corresponds to being in the ground band. For those of you who are more used to looking at these sideband pictures, uh, like in the clock community or opto optomechanics type communities, you can see the three different sidebands corresponding to the three different axes. Here they were intentionally at different intensities so that the sidebands have, the, you know, the, the radial trap frequencies are all different. And you can see that there is no red sideband, meaning you're really in the ground band of all three dimensions here. Um, and so, uh, so we, again, don't really have to worry about the motional degrees of freedom. But uh, one reason that people had avoided moving from one dimension to three dimensions up until now is because of these AC Stark shifts. And it turns out if you look at uh, what we call the magic wavelength of our, uh, of our trap, uh, that's a little bit more complicated than it sounds. There's the uh, scalar Stark shift, and that really just depends on the wavelength and the intensity of the light that you're using to do the trap. But then there's also the vector, which I'm not writing here because we have ways of essentially making it zero, and tensor star shifts, which depend on the nuclear spin state, uh, that the, the nuclear spins of the transition that, that you're actually driving. And in general, if you only have one uh, dimension, you can kind of control this. You can just sort of figure out what the right... Uh, what the value is for this one uh, dimension and set it to zero. You can get these two things to cancel and we can, that's what's been done in the past to still operate at what's effectively the magic wavelength for the nuclear spin states that you're considering. Um, but now we have three dimensions. We have uh, lattice beams coming from all three. And so what that means is that you can't have the same condition here where we've chosen to make uh, the, the, the polarization of our light perpendicular to the B field that we apply as a quantization axis they can't all be parallel. And so two of our axes do meet this criteria where they're parallel, but one, by definition, has to be not parallel uh, and, and, in fact, is perpendicular. And that means it's going to have a completely different uh, offset from the scalar magic wavelength. And so that's something that we had to carefully characterize, but it turns out that we can still use the same trick. So by applying different frequencies to that uh, extra uh, lattice dimension, we can still operate where all three of them have an AC, shark, uh, AC Stark shift that's effectively zero for both the scalar and tensor. Okay, great. And so, um, 
Now that we've kind of taken care of that hurdle, we can really look at whether we've solved the problem of interactions. So now, rather than having atoms trapped in this kind of tens of micron wide pancake, we have atoms tried in about a, trapped in about a 30 nanometer sort of little tiny sphere and in, in this kind of cubic lattice shape. And if you end up with two atoms per site, which does happen because we have two spin states in order to evaporatively cool and also to characterize the magnetic B field, we actually take advantage of the stretch states, so the plus nine, half, nine halves and minus nine halves nuclear states. Um, so uh, if you look at what happens now for the case where you have two atoms, you see that the uh, interaction peaks are completely resolved. So any sites that have, happen to have two atoms of, of, of the two different nuclear spins are completely separate from the carrier, just like for our emotional sidebands, and we no longer have to worry about them broadening our carrier clock transition. And um, so uh, just to remind you what it used to look like before, those two things were really overlapping and broadening our peak, and now they aren't anymore. And so now we can really zoom in. Yes. Forward here. This one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this asymmetry just related uh, to particles or not? Because broadening is asymmetric. Yeah, that's right. It's asymmetric, but it's it is entirely due to interactions. Yeah. So it's really. I mean, two particles. Or how many? Yes, we so think. It's a boson, for example. That's right. So there, uh, these are fermions. Um, yeah, fermions. Okay. yeah, but 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 we do believe that that in general, this it's true that there's many body interactions, so there can in principle be higher higher than two. But we do think that this is primarily due to, to two-body interactions, I would say. So, but, but, it, but you're right that there's also higher order interactions contributing. Yes, it, yes, it does, yeah. There's, so there's, there's a number of, of, of papers from our group about exactly this, but yeah. yeah. So, um, so now we can really focus on the single atom carrier. And sure enough, we see quite narrow uh, line widths. So here you can see for a four second clock pulse, we really still have a Fourier limited line with quite high excitation fraction. We basically excite almost all the atoms, which actually also tells you um, this is accounting for the, uh, the fact that we have two spin states. But, um, and then uh, here you can see a Ramsey experiment with, again, a four seconds of free precession where we still have pretty nice fringe contrast. And it, we're still kind of working on diagnosing exactly what limits this contrast. But one of the kind of now things that really does limit us is the quality of our laser, so our laser line width. In particular, each one of these data points takes 10 seconds of evaporative cooling before we can make this four seconds of measurement. And the laser is drifting around slowly at very low frequencies during that entire period. So um, over time, that means that you know, we, we slip fringes um, and have to, have to worry about also this line sort of slowly moving around. And so uh, one way to solve that is to do the kind of correlated noise spectroscopy I told you about before. But if you really want to make a better and more accurate clock, the other way to solve that is to really move to even better lasers. And so there's also been a lot of work in, in the E-Group and in collaboration with PTB on new, rather than ULE cavities, single crystal silicon cavities at cryogenic temperatures. And you can see here that um, this is, these are brand new results from PTB where they beat two of these um, single crystal, 21 centimeter single crystal silicon cavities together and saw a line width, a relative line width of about 10 millihertz or so. And we're actually starting to have similar results uh, at, at Jilla, this is, this is all part of the same collaboration with a seven centimeter silicon cavity um, at four Kelvin. This was at 120 Kelvin. But so, um, so anyway, I think this is quite promising for also sort of solving this problem by actually making better lasers uh, and, more, and more stable cavities. Um, other potential future directions that you, can, that you can take this 3D optical lattice clock include now looking at dipolar interactions uh, uh, from sort of neighboring lattice sites because now we no longer have to worry about collisional interactions on, on the same sites. So we expected about the 10 to the minus 19 level for there to be dipolar interactions, electric dipolar interactions between the atoms on, uh, on nearest neighbor lattice sites. And you can also think about looking at collective dissipation, so super and subradiant emission and things like that now that you have these atoms in a nice 3D uh, crystal. Um, and another kind of, um, uh, uh, I think, nice direction to take things in is to do kind of some quantum simulation of condensed matter systems and, and many body physics sort of really take advantage of these interactions and also some of the unique and, and kind of interesting Hamiltonians you can generate. And I'll just advertise you can't see it, but there's um, an archive paper where we did some of this in our uh, 1D optical lattice clock. And, um, and, and I think we have some, some pretty nice results in, in this direction of simulating some interesting uh, condensed matter Hamiltonians. Um, so final thoughts, uh, I think there's a lot of like really exciting and, and, and um, you know, we're, there's still theory papers being written, uh, you know, quite quite frequently about different applications of clocks to, to cosmology and to fundamental physics. And um, I, I hope I've convinced you that this new 3D optical lattice clock um, will help sort of 
tackle some of the uh, some of those problems and to really help push sort of precision measurement forward. Um, and uh, I also mentioned the uh, gravitational wave detector proposal that we have, which promises new capabilities, but also requires these kind of improvements in clock performance. And so there's still a lot of reason to kind of push forward on what clocks can do. And then these next generation of stable cavities often even further gains in, in absolute accuracy for uh, the clocks. So uh, let me acknowledge all of my uh, colleagues and collaborators, and in particular the Strontium-2, which is the 3D optical lattice clock. Um, that, that work was done primarily by these guys. Um, the Strontium-1 experiment I didn't really have a chance to tell you about, but that's the spin orbit work. Uh, that, um, and then the stable lasers are, are the ones responsible for, for both maintaining the ULE cavity and developing this next generation of, of beautiful silicon cavities. Um, and with that, I'll thank you for your attention and take any questions. So we, we don't know exactly right now. It's, it's, it's less than a half, but it's not, not a lot less than a half. Um, and you know, we think if we wanted to, we could push that more. So um, in the end, there's actually reasons why we've been lately going to lower densities. But um, yeah, I, I'd say it's, it's 0.3 or something on that order, but I'm just roughly estimating. We, we, we haven't characterized exactly what it is. Ten to the seven atoms, yeah. So, so why not more? Why not, you know, well, it's it's in the end, it's limited. Okay, so so the reason that we've been going to lower densities and smaller filling fractions and things is because there's inhomogeneities in your three D lattice. So not everyone, not all the atoms are seeing the same intensity of light. You know, as you move away from uh, the center of these uh, beams, and we ha we do have some effects from vector Stark shifts. So in particular, one of our beams is slightly ellip elliptical. And that gives you an additional Stark shift, which then is probably part of what's causing this decay and contrast of our Ramsey fringes. So you have to, you know, think about all of these different things. We need a certain, um, actually, surprisingly high intensities in order to suppress tunneling at the 10-second time scale. So it turns out you need more light than you would really think, because if you're worried about tunneling at a hertz rate, um, you, you need, you know, something like 50 or 100 E recoil traps in order to really suppress that enough. And so it's a matter of just like optical power. We, 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 we have six watts of optical power for, our three, uh, for all three of our beams that we split up between the three of them. And so you couldn't make the trap much bigger if you wanted to. Um, and so that means that with our 0 0.3, 0 0.4 filling fraction, we have something on the order of 1,000 or, or so or 10,000. So we haven't really dramatically increased the number of atoms compared to these previous things, like maybe by a factor of 10, but not more than that. So if you want to do more, you need more powerful lasers. You need a... Uh, higher intensities, so. Yeah. Yes, have you guys analyzed uh, for your gravitational wave proposal mm -hmm. uh, sensitivity towards uh, stochastic waves? Because I, I, I think the long baseline is a big win. Yeah, so, so that's not really something that, that we've looked at. I mean, we, you know, we, the sensitivity is essentially what, you know, what we quote there, but in terms of how that compares to what you expect the stochastic background to be, I'm not, yeah. Uh, well, okay, I guess I, I should take that back. It's, the sensitivity is not exactly what we quote because we're kind of assuming that it's a, it's a, it's a sine wave when we're yeah. calculating those things. So, random, yeah. I mean, the, the phase can random yeah. off of frequency. Yeah. Frequencies no, that's, that's true. So I, I take that back. It's something we haven't really looked at. So, um, so yeah, it would, be, it would be interesting to take a look. I know you guys have thought more about that in your, in your paper. So. Not, not that much. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, you know, so you had that pretty impressive uh, slide characterizing the coherence length of this next uh, generation of uh, lasers. Uh, so, uh, so what about um, doing interferometric uh, lunar laser ranging? Um, you guys I, I, that? I, I, I mean, in, in some sense, in some sense, that's kind of, I mean, that's sort of what, you know, Lisa is talking about doing, uh, like the length scales that they're talking about. And, and I mean, I think it's, it's possible, like, you know, once you have these cavities and can send them into space, you can think about doing sort of coherent uh, so interference. From the ground? Well, I mean, yeah, so I think the issue is, is photon flux, right? So, so right now, what they do is just time of arrival because you can, you, know, you can measure that with very few photons. But now if you really want to interfere them and split a fringe and things, you know, you're getting very few photons back off of the moon. So you might want to put another laser on the moon and phase lock it and then send it back, which is you know, kind of what, what Lisa's doing. But I, I don't think, there's, I don't think it's, it's crazy. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think in principle, yeah. I, um, 
you know, that's also something that we want to look into more, but. Uh.